I went to my grandmother before her last breath. She was the last grandparent I had left. I asked her what flower I should remember her by as I have a growing memorial of tattoos on my back. Without hesitation, she said, in Edelweiss. It was an ugly flower to me, furry with yellow eyeballs. I said, are you sure this is what you want me to remember you by? It's ugly and I'm not sure I want it on my body. She pursed her lips, closed her eyes, and turned away from me. The beloved flower of her homeland was all that represented her. I then asked her what I should do now that it wouldn't be long. She told me to keep going, her survival method for life. The year was 1950. World War II had just ended, killing 50 to 85 million people, and four countries descended on Germany to reconstruct. Foreign military men who had survived the war were everywhere. Munich, Germany, had been bombed 75 times. It was home base for Hitler and his Nazis. And Munich, Germany, is where my story begins. My grandmother, Elsa Hacker, her sister Vibe, and mother Anna had barely survived the war. Rations of buttermilk soup, bread, and potatoes were more than most would eat, and was all they had throughout the fighting. They emerged from bunkers and bomb shelters to news of a world destroyed. Her family had not agreed with the war, and Elsa opted out of the famous Hitler youth camps. She would move to the other side of town now to heed her own independence. Always independent, she found many jobs working in American military bases around Munich. To this day, we're not sure what she did there. Some say a coat check girl, others say a cocktail waitress. I like to think she was a dancer. But one thing is for sure. This is how she met Eugene. Eugene Reynolds hailed from Flint, Michigan, Vehicle City, a town like many in the Midwest, which was booming with its influx of blacks from the South who could finally decide for themselves. Within reason, of course, for this was 1950. The Civil Rights Act had not yet been passed. Interracial marriage was illegal in 30 states, segregation was matter of fact, and the KKK had been terrorizing the progress of our nation for 80 years already. Many black men jumped at the chance to prove themselves to a country that otherwise viewed them as less than human. Eugene was a lifetime military man and master sergeant in the 14th and 71st infantries, respectively. Against all odds, Elsa and Eugene fell madly in love. What that must have felt like after such a war, after so much combat, uncertainty, and death. There was hope that love could live between two vastly different upbringings. The thing that Hitler was trying so hard to prevent. They brought a new life into this world Beatrice Reynolds was born November 21st, 1953, in Munich. She was a part of the Mischlingkinder generation, that post-World War phenomenon of German women who had brown babies. In fact, 7,000 brown babies would be adopted at that time by African-American families as they were tossed aside by their white mothers. What on earth? would I do with a brown baby in post-Nazi Germany, Elsa often said. And even though they faced much discrimination, Beatrice was a product of their love, and so Elsa answered the call of motherhood, and Eugene promised them a better life in Flint, Michigan. And so Anna sadly put her daughter on a plane that would whisk her away to a new life. The family of three moved in with his mother, mother, Mel Void Wingfield, or Omama, in 1955. Omama's home was on the north side of Flint, the all-black side of shop workers and community makers. Yes, 
1955 was an awesome beginning. It was miles away from war, rations, and everything that Elsa knew. Perhaps in this new community, she found something similar to her own plight, perseverance. They were now painters of their own dream and discussed eventually moving to California, the land of abundance. But 1955 was also an ending. Just two weeks after moving his family to the States and marrying Elsa, Eugene boarded a plane to San Francisco, California, and the plane went down, crashed into Medicine Bow Peak in Laramie, Wyoming. It was the biggest commercial air disaster of its time, killing all 66 people on board, their souls released into the mountain air. In just two weeks, Elsa had her dreams fulfilled and reversely stripped away. She had not even had time to learn more than a few words of English. She was pregnant with her second child, and Beatrice was just two years old. When Eugene died, Elsa died a little bit as well. She would never recover fully, always clinging to his memory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. She would remarry for practicality, for she would never love another man again. She had three more children, Regina, Anita, and Curtis. She survived for them, although always with sadness and longing in her heart for she would always remember Eugene and the great love affair she had so briefly. Growing up was not easy for Beatrice or any child mixed with the oppressed and the oppressor within them. At home, she rebelled against her new stepfather and he in turn would lock her in a dirty, dark and cold basement for hours as punishment. It happened so frequently that her and her sisters would hide dolls and toys to keep her company. From the darkness, she heard abuse of all kinds. Her stepmother, stepfather to her mother, her mother to her sister, and society to the family's existence. On the street, she was bullied excessively for her unique look and sorrowful eyes. They would constantly pull her pigtails and pretend to ride them all the way to school as if she were a horse. They threw things at her, called her name so frequently that she would fall ill with the thought of going outside. In her reoccurring dreams, she imagined she could fly, and soon that is all she could think about, how to get away, how to keep going. Around the time when schools were desegregated and children bussed away to the white part of town, she discovered modeling. She was celebrated in the modeling world, an acceptance she had never felt. And when her entire community would pour their lives into the automobile industry, an industry that would eventually betray them, she took what she had and created her own life. It was then she decided to complete her father's trip to California. And so Elsa put her on a plane, as her mother had done before her, and Beatrice, my mother, would fly for the first time. She arrived in San Francisco in 1976 and met my father the first week she was there. They had the life that Elsa and Eugene always dreamed of. 
He took her first pictures, and she created an extensive modeling career that would last 15 years with clients such as Jessica McClintock, Esprit, Ebony Essence Magazines, and Ultra Sheen. I watched her create a life for us alongside of my father and was in awe of her. She taught me how to be unafraid and how to reinvent myself time and time again. Three generations after the beginning of this story, my mother has put me on more planes than I can remember. And even though my grandmother has passed on, we have never stopped flying. An Edelweiss flower is similar to my grandmother's story in that they were both raised in harsh environments. They are both strong and beautiful in their own unique way, and they both require sacrifice. An Edelweiss has a short but impactful life, understanding that in order to bloom, you must first take a risk. Because passion is not a promise but a catalyst for change, a waterfall of circumstance, and most importantly, a tool in which to persevere. Thank you. <laughs>